Here we are, it's me, John Park, and it's time for John Park's workshop. Thanks for tuning in. We are, we're up and running. Let's, uh, let's do this thing. So uh, thanks uh, for people over in the uh, chat there on Discord. Let me bring that up right there. Hey, hi everyone. Hey, Johnny Bergdahl. Hey, okay, you're on. Steve, in parentheses. Doctor, hello. Johnny Bergdahl, hey. I said hi to you twice. Hey, Dexter Starboard, Annie Calloway. Nice to see everybody, and uh, hi to people over on YouTube as well. If you're watching us on Twitch or Periscope or one of the other fine streaming services and you're wondering where all the chat is happening, head on over to Adafruit's Discord server, and it's on the live broadcast channel. And that's at uh, adafruit.it slash discord, and you can jump right in and uh, get an instant invite into our server. You wavy hand. Hello, Steve. Uh... All right, let's see, what are we gonna do here? Um, first thing I wanna do actually is mention that we've got, uh, I believe, a few spots left for this Ada box. Hey, look, I look like I'm wearing a big box right there. Hey, uh, Ada box 19. We've done quite a few of these, huh? Uh, head on over to the Adafruit Ada box page. Uh, I can bring that up right here. That's what it looks like. And uh, you can either subscribe for this one coming up. We may have a few slots left. We've just started sending out shipping notices, and I think maybe even started shipping. Uh, and if not, you can subscribe to the one after that, number 20, which will be coming out sometime in October. But this one's going to be shipping, like, real soon, or it's, or it's actually started. I sense movement in the whole shipping side of things. Uh, and I'm getting geared up to do an unboxing in uh, a little under two weeks. It'll be on, I believe, the 28th, which is a Wednesday. It'll be a takeover uh, of the normal Ask an Engineer time slot, and I'll be doing an unboxing there and then. So uh, head on over to the Adabox site and, uh, and sign up if it lets you. It should tell you if there's any left on this one on, on 19. Otherwise, you'll get in on the, the one following that. Uh, so who's excited about your Ada box? Has anyone gotten shipping notices? I think, I think those have gone out. I don't know if any uh, have hit people's doorsteps yet. I think it's a little early for that, but we've, uh, we've set the process in motion. So exciting, exciting Ada box. Uh, all right, what's next? I also wanted to mention that we've got uh, the job board over at jobs.adafruit.com. You can head over there and you can uh, take a look at the available job postings. They look an awful lot like uh, this right here. And this is a free jobs site where you can post positions if you're looking to hire someone, if you're looking to have some freelance or contract work, full-time, part-time, on-site, off-site. All of those are options. And you can also, if you're logged in, I don't think I'm logged in on this browser at the moment. If you, if you are logged in, you can uh, check out the available for hire, and you can also post your own info if you're looking to pick up some work. Uh, so that's the jobs.adafruit.com site, and uh, I recommend you check it out. Won't you please? Uh, all right, let's see. What else is happening here? Um, yeah, Johnny Bergdahl uh, brings up a, a point that the Adabox, due to changes in shipping uh, throughout the world, the costs of shipping in particular have gone 
bonkers. And so Adabox is available only in the United States and Canada right now. Um, I don't know if there's any uh, plans for changing that, uh, but we're, we're uh, currently only able to do those in the US and Canada. So uh, beware of that before you head over there to that website. Uh, let's see, did you know that I've got this show, the JP's Product Pick of the Week show on Tuesdays, happens at this time slot, so it's 1 o'clock Pacific, 4 o'clock Eastern, you should come, tune in next Tuesday, because on the show, I have a deep, deep discount, usually around 50% off, on a brand new product pick uh, of the week, sometimes it's digging into the archive, something, sometimes it's something that's been refreshed, most often it's something that's brand spanking new. Uh, and uh, this week, that's no exception, so uh, let me give you a little recap. This is normally a 15-minute show, but uh, I like to do a little one-minute recap so you can see what you missed. The 24LC32EE Prom Breakout. This is some memory that you can write information to, and it's not going to go away when you pull the power on it. So what I'm going to do is I'll go ahead and plug in one of my... EE prom breakouts and uh, nothing fancy, I'll just reset the board. And now when it restarts, you'll see it loaded in the first four bytes of information on the EE prom. So it looked at address 0, 1, 2, and 3. And from that, it grabbed these hex values. So what are those? Those are the RGB values of a number of NeoPixels. So now what I can do is go ahead and unplug that just like a game cartridge, plug in a different one. And again, I'll just go ahead and reset. Uh, and now we've loaded in some different values right off of the chip there. That's the product pick of the week. It is the 24LC32EE Prom Breakout on I squared C Stemma QT form factor. EE Prom. It's fun to say it. EE Prom. I like saying it. All right. Uh, what else is going on here? Let's, uh, let's, why don't we? Uh, dive into a circuit Python parsec. Check it out. All right, well, let's get set up here. For the circuit Python parsec today, I wanted to talk about mod operator or modulo operator. What is this? The modulo operator is a really useful arithmetic function that you can use in your code in order to iterate through a list endlessly. So one great use of this is you wanna press a button and each time you press it, you go between, let's say, three colors of NeoPixels, which is what I'm gonna do here. So first let's demonstrate it. You can see I've got a little circuit playground express here. And when I click it, I'll go between orange, blue, and magenta. And each time I click it, we go through those three colors. So how do we tell this thing to cycle between those colors? Well, the way I'm doing it in this code, one thing I actually want to set up for you here, uh, if you give me a moment, is I'm going to open up my serial. And Let's, uh, let's see what's going on here. So I've set up some code here that I think makes it clear what modulo does. Modulo is essentially A divided by B and the remainder is C. So in this case, I have this counter. Every time I press this button, the counter increments by one. So you can see that going 35, 36. So 36 divided by three, which is the size of this list I want to iterate to, that goes in, <clears throat> excuse me, it goes in evenly goes in 12 times with a remainder of zero. So I'm gonna use that zero as the first index in a list. The next time I increment this, we have a remainder of one. So three goes into 37, 12 times, remainder of one. One more time, three goes into 38, 12 times, remainder of two. The next time we go through this, hey, we're now back at a remainder of zero. So you can do that the sort of complex way. You can do that the nice easy way, which is what you see at the bottom there, 42. And then that percent sign actually means modulo. So 42 modulo 3 equals 0. Modulo 3 for 43 is 1, and modulo 3 of 44 is 2, and this goes on endlessly. Uh, and so the list here that you can see I'm using is this set of three colors, blue, magenta, and orange. There's the list, 
And so those are the items, zero, one, and two are blue, magenta, orange. So in my code itself, what I'm doing is a bunch of printing so that it looks nice. But then really, every time this button gets pressed, we just increment A by one, that's the counter, and then we run that modulo operation uh, on the, the list value, which is this right here. So C, which is the index, is the answer to A modulo B. And so that is a way that you can use the mod operator in order to increment through a list inside of CircuitPython. And that is your CircuitPython Parsec. Uh, now you know I'm going to have to go and edit that down into a little two-minute version later, and boy, I hope I wasn't clearing my throat the whole time. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I got something stuck in there. I'm going to have some water. <sighs> All right. Andy Callaway says, Modulus, my favorite operator. It's a good one, huh? And uh, over in Discord, I appreciate that, okay, you're on Steve echoed my sentiments of how much fun it is to say EEPROM. Thanks. All right, uh, let's see, what else? Uh, I think we're gonna dig into the meat of the project today. So, the, uh, let, me, let me jump over to the browser, actually, for a second here, and we'll, we'll talk about a couple things. So let's bring up this little Chrome window here. Uh, so, by the way, if you just go to adafruit.com slash new, you'll see our new products section. Uh, you can see the fun stuff that Lady Ada announced last night in the new, 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 new section. And if we scroll down a bit on here, uh, you'll see the uh, macro pad, which I'm going to be using for today's project. There it is. So if we click on macro pad there and take a look at... Scroll way down to the learn guide, primary guide. Uh, I've been using this for a couple weeks now, but the exciting thing is that Catney has uh, been working on a macro pad library that will make a lot of the things we're doing easier. So uh, the, the way that I was using it last week, I um, had a bunch of individual libraries for things like the, um, the keypad or the rotary I.O. for rotary encoder, or digital I.O. for using the switch. So uh, what Catney did was wrapped up the most common stuff that you'll use into this macro pad library. And so now the code is actually quite a bit more succinct and it's a little easier and more consistent to jump in and see how it works. So what I'll do actually is, let me show you some code here in Atom. And uh, you may have seen this last night, I demoed it on show and tell. I've made a sort of nice basic MIDI tester. So when you're using MIDI for, and you know I love MIDI, when you're using MIDI for uh, speaking to a synthesizer, you usually want to send things like note on off messages, you want, which is what plays actual different pitches. You want to send CC or controller changes, which is the uh, knobs or sliders on your synth for lots of modulation and parameters and filters and things. And uh, you want to send pitch bend often, which is to, just to take a tone and warp it one way or another, shift it. Uh, and in, in this project, I actually also wanted to use the uh, bank or preset uh, capabilities of a lot of synthesizers, which is, if you remember, uh, ever playing around with any kind of synthesizer, you're usually going to find uh, like a keyboard synthesizer all in one. You'll find there's buttons, like 128 sounds on there, and you can hit buttons to go between piano and maracas and drum kit and xylophone. Um, so those are presets or patches that are often um, ganged up inside of separate banks of, of presets and patches. So I want to send a type of message called program change that will talk to that. So all of those things I just mentioned, those are built into the MIDI library. So uh, in previous versions of this kind of code, I would have also, so I said I would have imported keypad, uh, rotary I.O., digital I.O., NeoPixel, um, MIDI. So now take a look. This is, this is my code here. I've got, I'm going to zoom this up a little bit. I've got... Um, just two imports that I'm doing. Importing Adafruit macro pad, 
and I'm importing rainbow, which gives me the color wheel, which is a really nice, convenient, quick shorthand for being able to adjust colors. Um, and what I'm gonna do is, I won't go through all the code right now. I'm gonna just talk about a couple things, then I'm gonna give you a demo of how it works, and then we'll come back and look at it in more depth. Uh, so in um, the setup here, you'll see, for example, instead of the normal NeoPixel uh, set up where you have to say how many NeoPixels, which pin it's on, what order of uh, color you're using. I'm just talking to macropad.neopixels right away. I wanted to set a brightness uh, and I wanted to fill them with a color and I've already set that color using this key wheel, so uh, this uh, color wheel rather. So the first thing that happens is it just fires up. There's, there's almost no setup for a lot of these things, which is great. Uh, MIDI, I am doing some setup on um, here where I'm creating some lists of notes and things like that. Uh, and then I'm jumping straight to display. So again, you'll notice I didn't have to import display IO and tell it the width and height because we already know that. The macro pad library knows what's on here. So uh, we get to be really succinct about it and just immediately start using this um, text lines and tell the display to show lines of text. Um, so very quick and easy to do this kind of setup. And then I'm also creating a little uh, sort of state for my uh, encoder position, the rotation of the, the encoder. Um, and then you'll see in running the code, just like with keypad, this is using keypad under the hood, I'm saying, okay, a key event is whenever macropad.keys.events get, which is once a cycle, it's gonna run through and just check, is any, are any of these keys being pressed or any of these keys, uh, have they been released? And I'll skip over this code for now, we'll come back to it. Same thing with the encoder switch. So pushing the switch, it just uses a um, part of the macro pad library to use a debounced switch pressed or released state. Super simple. And same sort of thing with the uh, rotation of the encoder. So the last position here, I'm saying, is that different from macropad.encoder? So that's how easy it is to ask for what's the position of the encoder. And uh, I'll get back to some of the, the sort of details of that later, but why don't we jump into a, uh, a little bit of a demo here that I've set up. Uh, let me go and wake up a laptop over here and, and uh, I'll do some demos for you. So here's what we've got. Um, I don't know, will that wake it up? No, I gotta, there we go. And let me turn off notifications on this one so it's not bugging us, it might, it might bug us. Do not disturb until tomorrow, that'll work. Okay, so I've got a laptop here and I've just set uh, a little piece of wood on top of it there so I could arrange things under the camera neatly. Uh, so you'll see I'm running some synth software. This is the Moog Model 15 synth software. So it's sort of an emulation of a classic synthesizer. Uh, let me zoom out a bit so you can see that a little better. And I might focus on the macro pad here. Okay, so you can see the, the synth back there. Um, so macro pad, by the way, I'll show you the, the code for this. I'm using it upside down. Uh, and again, this is kind of a neat thing. Since we have a matrix of keys, which we choose to call the first key, key one, two, three, four, five, six, on down through 12, uh, you'd probably have a bunch of annoying math to do in your code if you wanted to use it in the upside down mode or that sideways mode or that sideways mode, because this is sort of considered the natural state of the macro pad. Um, but Katni wrote a uh, little bit of code inside of the macro pad library. It might've been a lot of code, but exposed to us is a really simple thing, which is just rotation equals zero, uh, 90, 180, 270. So I've got this in this uh, 180 mode and it automatically flips the screen for me, flips the button order for me. So I don't have to change my code. Um, and uh, that's both the buttons and the NeoPixels. So it just works, which is great. So you see here, I've created some MIDI notes. So it's a chromatic keyboard working from the bottom up. And I have a little output on my display there just telling me which MIDI note number. So that's note 48. 
50. And then you'll see here it says mode patch four. So I'm using the fourth patch, which is a preset, a stored arrangement of stuff on the synthesizer. This is what it sounds like. Now watch this, I'm gonna turn my uh, little encoder knob here and you'll see my synth changing back there. So it's just rearranged a whole bunch of patch cables. That's why it's called a patch. And it's also changed a bunch of settings. So quite a different sound. Again, really different sound just by picking a different patch. Now, you could do this by clicking in the menu and dragging down, or you can use, I think, some arrow keys, but this is a really nice, quick way to flit, fly through some patches. So let's go to one that's got a lot of rich harmonics in it. Okay, that's a good one. So I picked that one because it has a lot of harmonic content in it, which means we'll be able to hear if I change the filter cutoff frequency of this with a, with a low pass filter. Uh, and so what I'll do is I'm gonna actually click the encoder wheel, which changes the mode. So right now we're in this patch selection mode. And now what I've switched into is CC mode. So CC mode means that I can use a continuous controller change, which is one of the knobs on here. In fact, let me refocus so we can see, uh, see the synth a little better. So you see here is this low pass filter fixed control voltage. As I change my knob on the macro pad, you can see the knob on the synthesizer software is changing as well. And here's what it sounds like when we do that. So it sort of muffles the sound, which is what this filter does, is it cuts off the frequencies that we can hear. Uh, and then we've also got, if I click this wheel again, we'll go to another mode. And now it says pitch bend. And right now it says zero. So it means the pitch is not being uh, altered from the expected setup that we have. So if we, if we, let me play a little higher note. So you can see I can pitch that up a little bit or down. Ooh, and this one's polyphonic, meaning we can have two notes at once, once which are sort of beating off of each other. Uh, and then we can, of course, wrap around back to patch there. Uh, so these are the modes, patch, CC, and pitch bend. So I can flip among those, and I can always access these 12 keys to play. Um, so if we... You can see it's actually kind of playable. You wouldn't, I'm guessing, use this as your primary instrument uh, interface, get a big keyboard of some kind. Um, but it's kind of neat to think of building a little utility like this. Uh, in fact, I was inspired, I'm sure, I, 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 subconsciously, I'm sure I was inspired by Retro Kits, which is a great uh, synth and MIDI gear company out of the Netherlands. They have a DIY project called the RK007 or 007. And it uses a matrix keypad, a little display, a knob, and uh, it's used for sending MIDI, not USB MIDI, but I think it's just for classic MIDI. Probably be adapted for both. And it lets you do things like pick um, different messages like these uh, program change messages, control change messages, uh, changing MIDI channels even, I think. So you could go uh, a pretty, pretty long way with this as a sort of diagnostic tool uh, same with the RK007, this idea of having a little, little box that just lets you access a lot of different MIDI parameters. Uh, so what I'm going to do is actually I'll unplug this from my little laptop here, and let's head over to my workstation. We could talk about the code a little bit. Uh, and I will take a look at the, uh, the Discord chat to see if we have any questions. Uh, let me bring that up in fact. So there are GIFs, okay, that's good. I like that. Uh, Lars thinks he's in space. What is he doing back there? That nutty guy. Uh, 
Hey, doctor said their Databox 19 is preparing for shipment. You must have got an email. That's exciting and fun. Uh, got a little elf gif there. Very nice. I'm so excited. Uh, let's see. That was very spooky sounding. Yes, for sure. A lot of those, those Moog patches, I think that's the, uh, I had the pads bank uh, selected there. And actually, that's something I'll talk about. I'm going to jump into a, a different synth software in a little bit. And we'll talk about uh, banks versus patches. Uh, so first, I'm going to replug repl in my macro pad. Uh, allow that to start up. And uh, by the way, one thing I didn't uh, mention, I'll just show it on here. I mentioned it last night. Uh, remember, I put rainbow in there, the, uh, the color wheel from rainbow in the libraries. Uh, so as I move through the patches, you'll see I'm actually changing the color and I'm going from essentially blue up to purple. And so I'm adjusting uh, through about half the color wheel um, and that's matching up with the uh, number of banks so or patches. So the number of patches you can send over MIDI is 128. So I'm basically using 128 degrees of that color wheel uh, just for fun, just to just to show, um, and you could you could get, like I said, really sophisticated with this. You could have say uh, colors assigned to particular patches or colors assigned to uh, particular banks, and um, so there it is. I've got it launched back up. Let's see if other questions we had. Uh, question about rotation: Can you change that on the fly? Oh, that's a good question. I am not sure if that's. Uh, if, if Katni's watching, let us know, because I just did it in setup. Um, but we, maybe we can test it. If we have time, we'll, we'll goof around in there. Um, let's see. Other. Oh, Todd answers that you can change display rotation on the fly, but you'll need to change your graphics layout. It doesn't change the keyboard layout. Huh. What does that do then? What, is, what does it change? The NeoPixels? I'm confused. Um, but yeah, when I set it in the initial uh, creating the macro pad object, it switches the whole thing. In fact, I'll show you that. Let's, uh, let's take a look at that. Let's do that first, in fact. So let's bring back uh, like this display, and I'll move our little friendly Circuit Playground Express off to the side there. And uh, by the way, you'll notice I've got a... Uh, sort of different arrangement here of the macro pad uh, back layer. I decided to expose this cool space uh, art here with the Vera Rubin quote. So you, could, you can put that on either way. And uh, that looks pretty good. So let's take a look. In the code here, right up at the top, macro pad equals macro pad rotation equals 180. Let's set that to zero. Uh, oh, actually, you know what? Let me reopen the code right off of the macro pad because I think I made a couple changes that are not shown there. There we go. Okay, so this is the actual code running on the device. Uh, I'm going to set rotation equals zero and hit save. And now we have it right side up instead of upside down, and it's still going to send the notes from sort of lowest to highest, bottom to top. Nothing else will have changed. I don't have a synth hooked up now, so you won't hear anything. Um, but that's, we'll do that, uh, let's go 90 degrees. I don't know which one's 90 and which one's 270, if it's clockwise or counterclockwise. Uh, there we go, it's counterclockwise. Oh, no, it's clockwise. We just made it all the way around 270. Uh, yeah, so you can see, let me do 90. And after it restarts, there you go. So now that 50, uh, oh, wait, did that not work? Ah, oh, that's interesting. Might have, might have found a bug, because that should be the lowest number, but it's acting like that one is. I don't think I tested the sideways button order so bad me, I should have tested that. Um, but you can see you've got shorter text lines, but more of them. So for some applications, this may be uh, 
maybe the way you want to go. In fact, I have a project in mind that's going to use that. But for this one, let's jump back to uh, 180. And then uh, let's talk about what else is going on in here. So color wheel I'm setting up. Uh, I mentioned setting up the pixels right there, very simple. The uh, text that I'm creating to display there as a little list because that changes with each, uh, each of these button presses we switch out. So again, this is this macro pad display text lets you just create lines uh, like zero through four, zero through five in this orientation, I can't remember. And uh, it'll just display those. In fact, you can uh, put a space just by calling this line two, it'll skip line one. And, uh, and then saying lines show pops that up on the display. And uh, so as far as the MIDI events go, when, when I, or the MIDI sends, when I detect a key event using the macro pad key events get, uh, this uses the keypad library underneath the hood that Dan Halbert created, which is excellent and works on matrix keyboards, uh, one switch per pin keyboards, and shift register keyboards, of which I do not have an example, so I can't try that, but uh, maybe with an old SNES controller, I think that uses a shift register. And then this is the sort of bulk of the code for the key presses is if a key event happens, so if key events pressed, just change the state from not pressed to pressed, uh, I am creating this variable called key, which is the key event key number. So if I press this one, that's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. Then macro pad MIDI send, macro pad note on, and then we could send a note, we could send MIDI note one, which is so low you probably can't hear it. Uh, but instead, I'm going in, up and grabbing from a little uh, list I made of MIDI notes, and those are uh, correlated to the keys. So remember, actually, MIDI note one is up at the top. I, I, or uh, uh, Sorry, the macro pad key is up at the top. I, I got that backwards a second ago. Um, so this key down here is uh, 10, or what, 10? Yeah, 10, 11, 12. So 10 is this note 48, 11 is this note 49. 12 is this note 50. And then uh, I, after I press that key, I adjust the key to be green. So you see when I press them, they turn green. You can't see it on the screen as well there. but uh, And that's just using 90 on the color wheel. It's this 0 to 255 color wheel. And then I change the line, uh, line one text to say note on, and then using a little of our string formatting to, to write the note. And that's what gets printed down here, 48, 49, 50, and so on. When I release, here's what we do. We again find out what number did that just happen to because we can press a bunch of these. So right now, if I wanna release uh, a note and have that go from green back to blue, it has to know which one that happened to. And so it'll do it for, for each of those in turn because it's aware of which, which key just got released, which is great. Uh, we send the note off command, so these will play as long as they're held. So this uh, sets that note to stop. Um, and then I set the key color back to whatever it was based on our, our knob turn. And then I print on the little display there that we've uh, released that note, so note off and then the MIDI note. So for the uh, switch that's on the encoder, this push encoder switch, click, click, that's what switches between my modes. And what I'm doing there is again using a really nice convenient script that Katni wrote. By the way, Katni is in the chat now over on, uh, on Discord. So hey and thank you. Uh, and ask her deep important questions about this stuff if I've gotten anything wrong, please correct me. Uh, so when we press this, we just check for the macro pad dot encoder switch debounced press. So it uses a debouncer, so we don't have to worry about uh, holding it and it runs through a bazillion times doing something. It just has that, uh, that debouncer state change. It doesn't um, uh, get ghost hits or multiple hits. And we don't have to do anything complicated in code about that, which is great. So what I'm doing is I have a little, uh, remember our friend Modulo. This was uh, what I showed in the CircuitPython Parsec earlier. 
here I'm using it again. So mode is mode plus one modulo three. So every time I click on this mode thing, it switches its, its uh, index. So it's gonna go zero, one, two, zero, one, two, zero, one, two. Um, mode can be one of these three things. Sorry, let me scroll up a little. If mode zero, uh, then I'm gonna print the mode is whatever that current text mode is, uh, which is uh, when it's zero, it's the patch mode. When it's one, it's the CC mode. And when it's two, it's the pitch shift mode or pitch bend mode. Uh, and then I print the value. Now the values that I'm printing here are slightly a lie just because some things are in kind of weird different scalings like pitch bend is 16,543 or whatever uh, values. It goes negative 8,000 something and positive 8,000 something. Uh, that's just how MIDI works for that. Um, other things are zero to 127, but we want to see them one to 128 uh, and so on. So I'm, I'm messing with the, the display a little there. And I uh, also want to do some scaling. So with the CCs, I didn't want to have one click of the rotation on the encoder equal one CC, because then we would have to rotate the thing like 10 times in order to go from minimum to maximum CC. So I'm actually scaling that by about four, 4.1. Um, and this is just for the display up here right now because that's all clicking does is it changes that display and it changes the value of mode. How we use that happens a little later. Um, by the way, also one other thing happens is there's a little red LED there. Uh, you can see it glowing my finger when I press it. So that's a little LED built right onto the macro pad board and uh, I'm just lighting that up when I press this for fun. And then uh, when I release, all I'm doing is turning that light off. So this released state just lifts, uh, lifts that LED off. Then this is the, uh, how easy it is to check for changes in the encoder rotation. So my last knob position uh, was what we started with when we turned it on or reset it. Uh, and then initially, if we go up to the top, that is either I set it to zero or just to read the encoder. Yeah, so last knob position is whatever the macro pad encoder is at when this starts, which it resets itself to zero. Uh, so then what we do is we check and see if that position is different from what the encoder position is, which is this rotation. As soon as I turn this, those two numbers become different. So that is essentially a state change that checks and sees, okay, you're turning it. Now I have a variable called knob position that equals whatever the encoder is at. Uh, and then I do some uh, math here to um, be able to put this into usable ranges and also to essentially limit how high or how low it can go. So we use some min max, uh, which uh, credit where credit is due, Toddbot helped me figure this out. So thank you, Toddbot. You can ask him in the chat if you have questions uh, for, for about this and details on this. Um, but you can see it in use, uh, let's see, right here. So the MIDI values of mode, uh, when we're in program change, those can go from zero to 127. And so this min max MIDI values mode plus the knob delta from zero to 127 basically means we'll only allow the knob to register down to zero, even though it can get positions infinitely lower than zero and infinitely higher in the other direction. Uh, then we send that value. So again, macro pad MIDI send, macro pad program change MIDI values and whatever that number is, zero through 127. And then that's what the synthesizer is using to change its presets or its patches. Then I do this color, uh, this key color value is a variable that I change as I turn the knob. And I wanted to start for whatever reason at the cyan. So I added 120 to it at the beginning and I keep that, keep that up here. Uh, and then we fill the uh, pixels. Oh, we're on pitch bend. Let's go back to patch. And then I fill the pixels with whatever that color is. So again, that's kind of a slow change. That would be a lot faster if I hooked that to the CC because uh, that one whips through in about a couple turns. So if we switch instead to mode one, so we go from CC, uh, or rather from uh, program change to CC, now we do a slightly different scaling. So I'm saying I just want to go from zero to 31. So I want 32 uh, possible values 
which is a subdivision of the 128 that it can actually be, which means I turn the knob four times fewer to get to the top, or every little click of the, um, the encoder goes up by four, 4.1, which gets me the full range, zero to 128. Uh, and then for pitch bend, we do a similar thing, except now it's uh, just the range is zero to 15, gives me a full range of the, uh, the pitch bend, which usually is a two semitone pitch bend. Your, your synthesizer or your synthesizer software can change that, but usually that 16,384 values equates to two semitones below zero and two uh, below sort of the, the root pitch and two above. Uh, and then we, uh, for state de detection, we set that last knob position variable to be equal to whatever the encoder is at. Shoo! Uh, so let me look and see if there's any questions uh, before I move on. I'm going to show just a little bit of a demo of some of these MIDI values coming out of here. Uh, we'll spy on those. And then um, we'll, we'll look at one other synth thing that I wanted to show you. It's super cool. Um, Let's see, Todd says, the rotation of keys and LEDs and displays is super handy because people have different needs about where a USB cable should come out of a device. This is true. Uh, you might want a 4x3 instead of a 3x4. Uh, I actually kind of like this uh, having, uh, for, for this, which is kind of a handheld, I imagine this is a handheld thing. I like having this little display down at the bottom like that. It's kind of nice. Um, this is the, the more typical on-your-desk display where you can see the, uh, the screen up on the top. And, uh, oh, Doctor asks if there's an I squared C slider board, because that could go on the side with 3D printed brackets. So, uh, do we have, I don't know if we have a slide potentiometer with I squared C yet. We just have, yeah, we just have the Trinky that's a USB. Um, so we don't have a ready-made solution, but you could probably do that with uh, uh, an I squared C, um, ADAC, uh, analog to digital converter, and then plug a potentiometer into that. Um, Meridian Prime has shown a cool uh, 303 acid synth. Awesome. And let's, uh, let's jump into taking a look at some of these MIDI messages. So I'm going to launch my uh, little MIDI monitor program here. And i got to share this. Sorry, I forgot to set this little guy up and share it earlier. Uh, how about, I'll just add a screen if you'll bear with me. This might make my um, broadcast glitch, so sorry if it does that. Let's see, add a screen. And now we wait. promise it's thinking. There we go. Let's switch that to a window. And MIDI monitor. There we go. Okay, so uh, this is now just spying on the outgoing USB MIDI messages. Um, so if you see here, when I press this first note, uh, this first key, my uh, display on the macro pad says I've sent note on for 48. And you can see there in the MIDI monitor, yeah, sure enough, note on over channel one uh, for note 48. And it also is telling me that we have a uh, velocity of 120. Now, we also get this uh, extra byte, which is just a bug that's being worked on in, uh, in our USB uh, for, uh, for all the USB MIDI stuff on our devices. They, there's just a bug right now. Uh, and then when I, really, <laughs> when I release this, you're going to see it's going to send a uh, note off message. So note on, and then I release note off. And I'll clear this just to make the display neater. I don't think I can zoom this, unfortunately, can I? 
note. Uh, you'll see if I press another note, like note 56 here, then I can release either and either. So that's how that uh, macro pad pressed and released from the keypad library works, which is, which is terrific. Um, now, oh yeah, you know what? Someone just said zoom enhance. Well, I can do zoom enhance because I'm not going to show too many messages. So let's uh, allow me to zoom enhance. Whoop, there we go. Uh, so now you can see when I click the encoder to uh, patch and I rotate, I get a program on channel one and the data is sending a 127. So that means I was all the way cranked up at the top. So as I scroll this back, I'm going through every possible of the 127 possible patches that we can send. So now I'm at, uh, let me clear that. Now I'm at the bottom, the very first patch, one, two, three, four, and so on. Uh, you could of course set this to send over a different MIDI channel if you had a reason to. Uh, you could have MIDI channel selection be part of the UI on here. You could have MIDI bank selection be part of the UI. You could have which CC number you're sending be part of the UI. So it's all things that you could code on here pretty readily, I think. Uh, so I'm going to switch to uh, the CC mode here, and you'll see as I turn this, I'm sending on MIDI CC number 74, which is often a filter frequency. You can assign it in your synth software for whatever you want. And then it jumps up by four every time I turn one notch of this encoder. Um, and that's because I just didn't want to be turning forever. So if we start at the bottom here uh, and I go, that's basically a half turn that gets me to 36, another half turn 65, another half turn 94, another half turn. So it's about two full turns will get me uh, all the way up there or a little crank, little half turns. Uh, all right, so let me close. Oh, you know what? I won't close that. Let me just hide that. Uh, last thing I wanted to do is just kind of share a, a pretty cool synth that you can get your hands on for free. That Moog synth, I think, might be $15 or $30 right now. Sometimes it's free. It, was, it went for free in, back in April, I think. Um, but here's a really cool app. Uh, in fact, I'm going to jump to my browser. And this is a free synthesizer that is near and dear to many people's hearts uh, because it is an emulation or simulation of the realistic or Radio Shack brand MG1, uh, which if you, if you look at it, that's, that's the Wikipedia page on the MG1. Uh, it was called the Concert Mate MG1 as well, and Radio Shack had a line of synthesizers in this Concert Mate series, but this is the only one of them that was actually manufactured by Moog. So it was a, uh, at the time, a $500 synth that came out in 1981, and it is not the same as any particular Moog, but it has a lot of the, the same characteristics as uh, some of the Moog synths of the era, uh, just with a couple of differences, but it's... Um, a really neat synth, really fat sounding. Um, and this is the uh, Cherry Audio, it's a synth company. They make this software synth that is currently free. I don't know if they have plans on selling it uh, again because they, they say uh, now free. And then down here it says $25 and that's crossed out free. Um, so I recommend this one because it's got um, a, a ton of presets in it. It's got, I think, 128 presets in it that we can scroll through with our knob there. Uh, it actually does uh, polyphony, so you can hold down multiple notes at once, uh, which is somewhat accurate to the original. It had, I think, two oscillators and then this polyphony third oscillator, and I think it, it allowed you to play more than the three notes, though. So uh, I, I can't remember if that's paraphonic rather than actually polyphonic, but... Um, you can get multiple notes at once, which is kind of cool. And uh, it allows you to assign CC to, to change things on it. Um, so what I'll do, actually, I'm going to jump back over there. I don't have it installed on this machine, I don't think. But I'll, I'll jump over there and uh, show you running through its presets. Because unlike, um, unlike that Moog synth, which thinks in terms of um, banks, this one instead just has one long list of presets, so you can scrub through all 127 of them, no problem. Uh, let me just get a USB adapter here. And 
let's relaunch. And I'm going to quit that one and load this one here. There we go. And I think I can just scale that. That's nice and big. Whoa. Uh, so if you if you're wondering about let me turn the output to my amplifier. Hold on one second. Uh, audio and MIDI audio through headphones. There we go. Uh, so in the software, you'll see there's a big list. These are, if I set it to all presets, these are the bazillion presets, and you can go through and pick them by name, which is cool. Um, but again, that, that's the big list that we're switching when we use our uh, macro pads patch. Woo! Uh, you can do things, a lot of these have detunings among the three oscillators so they can get pretty raunchy sounding, uh, which may be what you're after. I don't judge. Uh, I'll set this back here. So uh, again, this will work. Um, let's find a nicer patch. I like that. So you can see here, this is that uh, filter. Again, I've assigned this MIDI number 74 to drive that knob. Uh, and like I said, you could in here code something where you get to pick CC numbers, which is then assignable to pretty much anything in here. So you could go through one at a time and, and, and play things. In, in reality, you'd probably want a box with eight or 16 rotary encoders on it to do lots of, of sort of hardware style changes on the fly. Um, but this is fun for testing for sure. And uh, then pitch bend, will, pitch bend will work as well. Uh, so that's the MG1 based on that Radio Shack realistic slash Moog uh, synth, which is super cool. Um, and uh, apparently one of the more um, common ones to find just because they were cheaper than Moog, so they sold a lot of them. They're sold at Radio Shack, uh, so, so you can still find them. They, I think, usually run around $700 to $1,000 in the used market for one that's a little grungy, um, but it's been a while since I looked. I don't have one. I wish I did. Uh, all right, so I think that's going to do it for today. Uh, let me, let me uh, jump back over to the workbench there or the, the uh, workstation and see if anyone's got any other thoughts and questions before we sign off. Um, hi, Dave Odessa, who said they were late. Sorry, you were late. Uh, let's jump over to Discord so I can see it there. Uh, more rotaries. Yes, in fact. The uh, Oh, yeah, Meridian Prime said that there, there was a um, there was a 303 clone that Lady Ada made about 12 years ago called the Zox Box, X-O-X -X box. So instead of an 808 or a 303 or a 909, it was X-O-X. -X. But it was based, it was based on the, the, uh, the 303. Um, hard to find them now. I have a PCB for it, but a lot of the parts are hard to find, so I've never built it. Maybe one day. Uh, doctor said, something I didn't catch is the MacroPad sending the MIDI instructions directly, or is there software bridge? It is direct, so USB MIDI flies right into the software. You don't have to do anything in the middle. I was using that monitoring program just to look at it, but uh, this will work also for, for hardware synthesizers that have a USB MIDI host built into them. Um, so you'll see I've often used this 1010 Music Blue Box, a little sample station. That has a USB host MIDI um, port, so you could plug something like this into it and then use its own uh, setup to, to say what, what uh, influences what as you turn knobs and press buttons. Um, let's see. Oh, and Todd answered that question. Thank you. So I'm, I'm behind the curve by a couple minutes here. Uh, oh, you can still get the Zox Box synth kit PCB set. I didn't I don't think I realized that. Check it out. Yeah, here it is. That is... Uh, That's the Zox kit, and it costs 303. Oh, $3.03. There's four of them. So if you're 
thinking about doing it. It is an intense build with a lot of hard to find parts, but uh, people dig them. It's a whole world of uh, people using those out there. Uh, let's see, other Discord happenings. Uh, oh, Steve has one. You've got his ox box right there. That's cool. I don't have any 303 type of synths. They got that syrupy, drippy, filtery acid sound. Uh, doctor said Cherry Synths requires an account. Okay, good to know. So you will need to uh, have an account in order to get the, uh, the free synth. Dexter says JP has all the cool tools. Man, that's a free synth. I don't have the real one. Ah, uh, oh, Steve's got a picture in the Discord there of that lovely build of the, uh, of the Zox box. Maybe you can bring that on show and tell sometime and play it for people. It's been a while since anyone's heard those. Uh, all right, I think that's going to do it. So, hey, thanks so much for stopping by today. Um, and thanks again to the whole CircuitPython team and Dan Halbert in particular for the key switch library and Katni for the macro pad library, which is making life so easy for coding this kind of stuff uh, on, on the macro pad. Love it. Uh, and thanks also to Todd for help with that min max stuff for rearranging my my values there. Wanted to see if I could do that without importing extra libraries. Um, and I think that's going to do it. And thank you, the viewer, for stopping by today and hanging out and coming into the chat. Uh, and so please remember, we will have a Adabox unboxing coming up, not next Wednesday, but the one after that. So that's the 28th of July. Uh, and that'll be at the normal Ask, the Ask an Engineer time slot. Um, which I'm not going to say because I always forget by like an hour. I think it's at 8 p.m. Eastern, though. Uh, if anyone knows in the chat, let me know. Hey, Minnesota Mentat, thank you also. Uh, and uh, next Tuesday, I'll have another JP's product pick of the week. I probably won't be dressed up like a cat. Meow. Uh, but you will probably get a great discount on a cool thing. So why not come and check it out? And uh, that'll do it. So I believe there's going to be a uh, deep dive with Scott tomorrow at 5 o'clock Eastern time. So please stop by. And then we have a bunch of other uh, happenings going on with different people going on podcasts and hack chats and, uh, and things like that. Hackster and all kinds of things. So uh, check our blog because that's the best place to find out about it. Or ask people in the, uh, in the Discord. Uh, what's going on? What's happening? All right. So that's going to do it for Adafruit Industries. I'm John Park, and I will see you next week. Bye-bye.